Well, hello to everyone and welcome to the latest episode of the Nordic Football Podcast. I am Steve Witz and I'm joined as ever by Jonathan Faduba. And I know Jonathan is in a very uh, electric mood this evening at the time of recording. Uh, you're well up for this one, aren't you, my friend? Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I've got uh, I've got the gleam in my eye tonight. I think this is going to be an electric podcast. I've just I can see even in your eyes, Steve, just a little sort of cheeky, cheeky smile. <laughs> I can see a little cheeky smile, and there's a few things I think we've both got to get off our chest in this one. Um, so yeah, welcome to the show. Obviously, um, covering Norway and Sweden as always, and we're getting towards the sort of latter stages of the season now. Twenty games plus in get into the final stretch, aren't we, Stephen? The things are starting to uh, get a little bit tasty. They certainly are. And, uh, yeah, I think this episode could get potentially spicy, um, <clears throat> especially in the Swedish uh, section. We've got plenty of things to discuss about. Uh, European matches, uh, Alsvenskan matters, uh, Lita Serien matters. Uh, actually, at the time of recording just now, there has been some breaking news. Uh, coming in from uh, the Arsvensk. And we've been just been bombarded by Watford fans and um, podcasts and anything related to the Hornets because Kalmar's striker, Mileta Rajovic, is on his way to a Vicarish, Vicarage, Vic, Vicarage Road. I was getting all French there. Um, uh, what do you make of this one, JF? Because, uh, I mean, he was actually in one of your tend to watch this season but uh, did you anticipate a move to the English Championship this soon? Yeah we thought why not just uh, get cracking on some of the transfers especially with the window about to close there's a few quite a few transfers to talk about actually on this episode and one of the main ones of course is Mileta Radjevic to Watford now this one's come out a little bit out of left field because all the reports seem to be driven by Watford um, sort of accounts and Watford personalities I haven't actually seen a huge amount of reports in Sweden so this is a little bit out of the blue I'm not entirely sure the accuracy of it um there's been reports that Radjevic was left out left out of the Kalmar squad obviously for this reason now the reports are that he's on his way to 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 Hertfordshire or London to do a medical and uh, a fee's been agreed so let's talk about Mileta Radjevic as he said there Steve, I mean just as a side note since that news broke I've had people I mean I think I'm the most popular man in Watford this evening uh, Watford Gap is my territory because I've had DMs, I've had people adding me on LinkedIn, I've had people f- f- following my Instagram, DMs on Instagram, DMs on the Nordic Football Podcast, we've had emails. I mean, I feel like a hunted man, Steve. Um, so I don't, I don't exactly know what's going on. I'm not, not quite used to this uh, adulation, but yeah, plenty of questions about Ray Rich. So, so let, let's have a little look at him. I, mean, I did refer people to our 10 to watch, 20 of the finest picks he could have in Norway and Sweden, selected in April. Um, so Radjevic was on my list of 10 to watch in Osvenskan this season. So, of course, if you're a loyal supporter of the Nordic Football Podcast, which I know many of you are, uh, you will already know who this player is and you will be one step ahead of the game. But just to introduce him to maybe um, Watford fans who might be listening to this for the first time or might not know any, anything about the player, a uh, couple of things I said in my um, Osvenskan 10 to watch about this player now. He caught my eye, actually, in one of the early games around pre-season, just before the season started and some of the reports about him. Now, this is a player, I think he's turned 24 now. He was 23 at the start of the season. Uh, he was signed by Kalmar. Uh, he was Bromby Youth, uh, and he had an excellent scoring record in Denmark for a team called Nicefit. Now, um, he played... Yeah, that, this is where he came to my attention, Steve, in the Swedish Cup, uh, which is traditionally played early season, sort of February time, before the season begins. Uh, in sort of April um, time, so so when Radio is signed, he scored four games and four got five goals, sorry, in four games in the Swedish Cup. Uh, and I thought to myself, who is this? Who is this lad? Um, he's been described by in, he's been described on one Swedish website as uh, one eighty nine centimeters tall, tank of a forward. And uh, Steve, I did say this to you, I think, and I've said it a few times actually. When we we have talked about Radio a few times on this podcast, I said to you at the time. I do like players with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. I like players who have a bit of confidence about them. Maybe not Zlatan level, but just I like players who come into a league and they say, uh, and this was the quote from Radjevic when he came in to Osvenskan, he said, I want to be the golden boot winner. Now, you'd think someone coming from sort of Danish lower divisions would not have that kind of big uh, appetite to make bold statements. But I, I, some people would say, oh, that's a bit arrogant, but I loved it. 
um, and he is a tank of a forward. Like that, that description has always stuck with me, um, and I've used it to describe him a few times. He is a tank. Now, the interesting thing with him, as he's adapted, he's been really, really good. Now, there was a period of time where, actually, I was in Gothenburg at the time, and an interesting story with a loyal listener of the podcast, loyal friend Sam Hart. I was in Gothenburg with him watching a game. And I told him to captain Radovic for his fantasy team, and he did score twice in that game. And I think uh, I didn't captain him, which is annoying. Basically, the point I'm trying to make is everyone. There was a period of time where everyone started to put Radovic in their fantasy team because he was, he just became he just he just kind of exploded onto the scene. Um, Steve and he's he's really carried on that form into the season. He scored seven goals, and he's been a very sort of important part of of Kalmar's team. Now Kalmar changed managers. They've had a bit of a regeneration this season. Manager left. He was a top manager. Went to Malmo. And um, he's had to adapt, basically, Cal- uh, Radio, which is their sort of main main forward. Now, I mentioned they've had quite a low XG, Calma, in general, not really scored many goals, expected goals. But um, in 20 games, Radio in Elsvenskan has scored seven goals. Uh, he's got one assist. Um, in the Swedish Cup, as I mentioned, he's got five goals in four appearances. So in total, he's got, I think, for Calma, I think 12 goals in total um, in about 24 games which isn't bad. Um, but what I would just say quickly, Steve, I know you'll probably have a couple of comments and maybe a question, but the, the one thing I just wanted to say about Radovic in terms of summing him up, I think this is a good move for Watford because I think he can go up a level. Now, championship is a ver- is a big jump. So, you know, we'll talk about that in a second. But the, the one thing I just want to say about Radovic is I think he's playing in a team that hasn't suited his qualities. And I said it about three or four episodes ago, Steve, when we talked about Kalmar, I said, if Radovic goes to a better team, I think he's he will be a, could potentially be a top player. Um, and I said to him, I said to you on that podcast about two, three episodes ago, you can go back. I said, I'd love to see him at Malmo. I'd love to see him at maybe a Hammerby or a sort of um, uh, a Hacken team that creates loads of chances for him because he's, he's a penalty box poacher. You're going to ask me what type of player he is, but I feel like going to a bigger team that has wide players who can create more chances than Kalmar, I think this is a real potentially big player. Championship level is a big step up, but in summary, Steve, I think Watford fans can rightly be pretty fairly excited about this low key. I I have to agree with you. I think um, this is a man who has been very very frustrated recently, uh, lacking service. It's quite obvious he's um, put him in a better team where there's more chances, and he will deliver the goods. Uh, Kalmar have the lowest xG average out of any team in Alsvenskan, 0.95. So put him in. You know, Watford outfit, which are expected to challenge probably for the playoffs at least. Um, I think it's a good bit of talent spotting, really. We've seen recently Akor Adams move to Montpellier from Lillestrom. I think they're, they're two similar types of players, actually, quite physically strong. He already he set the, um, you know, the ground running um, there. So I think it could be a smart move uh, for Watford. But what do you reckon? Are they really getting from this striker? Then can he make the switch up to championship level? What sort of attributes does he have to make him the ideal skill set there? Yeah, and no, I would agree with you. And I think in terms of uh, obviously we have a partnership with Wisecow and just looking at his numbers in Osvenskan this season, he's he's averaging 0.34 goals per 90, uh, 0.005 assists, which is obviously he's not really someone who's going to get assists. But he's averaging 2.1 shots per match, 50%, 48.9% uh, accuracy. And I think that kind of sums him up, Steve. He's someone who he's good in the air. He's strong as an ox. He's a tall player, a um, bit of confidence about him. And he, he is a penalty box poacher. He's someone who can score goals, right foot, left foot, uh, header. He can receive the ball. He can sort of play with back to goal. And he can also sort of um, get in the six-yard box. I'm really, I really like his running maybe runs to the near post, runs to the back post as a striker. If you put in crosses across the box, he's someone who's going to come alive in that penalty area. Now, I think, like I say, he had a period of season where he was thriving for Kamar at the early season. And then he kind of has gone a little bit dry there, as you alluded to, Steve. He's right, goals have run a little bit dry recently. Had a few games where he was taken off, didn't really massively impress. But he's obviously done enough to alert the attention of Watford scouts. And... Um, yeah, I think this is a little bit of a smart smart bit of business. I'm not entirely sure he'll go straight into Watford's first team. I think they've got other players he will rival with, and I think he'll have to maybe compete for a place on the bench. But I did say that with Benny Traore, who, of course, is in Sheffield United's first team playing Premier League football, which I thought the jump was too big. Osvenskan straight to Premier League. 
um, and Traore is already playing in the league. So perhaps it's case by case basis, you know. But I think the one thing I would certainly say, Steve, Radovic has got the physical qualities to to play in the championship. I think it's a physical league. You need to be strong, and I think he is. Um, and what I would sort of conclude by saying is normally players like this, I would say it's too early. Like they've only played 20 games in offense. And it's, you know, you need a bit more time. I actually think at the age of 24, I'm actually quite pleased for him. I, I feel like this is the kind of movie he needs to get his career going. I've said a few times, I think there's a real player in there. If, if, um, if he could be around maybe better, better players with no disrespect to Kalmar. I just think that he, um, I think he is a level above Kalmar. Uh, I know there's a couple of famous listeners that might not like me saying that, but I just think he is ready for like a big step. And it doesn't surprise me that a, a team like Watford's coming in from. I actually think this is quite a smart bit of transfer business. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it's an encouraging move for him. And I wouldn't say I'm happy to see him leave the league because I think he's a quality. I, I enjoy watching him play, basically. He, he makes Cal more interesting for me to watch this season. I quite like his, his cut and thrust. Uh, he's an aggressive player as well. Cameron are quite pretty in their football, but he's like the aggressive sort of um, thrust at the end of it. But I actually think that he's, I think he's almost ready for that move now. So, yeah, big news coming out of us, out of, um, well, English Championship tonight uh, and North Svenskan. Yes, uh, big moves indeed. Uh, we've got a few other transfers to talk about in this show. Uh, we might as well stick with our Svenskan. While we're, while we're at it, I'll go through... Uh, let's go through the results of the most recent round, round number 20. Uh, Varberg nil, Var, uh, Varnamo three. Uh, looks like Varberg are pretty much gone. Degger Forge one, IFK Gothenburg two. Bromma Poikan the three, Halmstad one. Uh, a pair of nil-nil draws between Malmo and Jorgarten and Kalmar and Hammerby. Uh, Hecken three, serious two, probably the game of the round. Plenty to talk about uh, that later. Uh, Elfsburg 2, Mialby 0, Norshipping 3, RK 1 on Monday night. And what that does for the table, clear three-horse race at the top. Elfsburg 45 points, Hecken 42, Malmo 42. Sorry, Hecken 44, Malmo 42. But all three teams pretty close in their goal difference as well. Down at the bottom, Varberg on 11, Icor on 19 along with IFK. And then you got Degafors and Sirius on 20 points each. So where are we going to start at the top of the table uh, this week? Uh, Jonathan, just looking at the itinerary here. And uh, a big transfer for Mal- Malmo, who I can't get this team because it looked like they were back on track with a couple of good wins at home. And now they've, they've lost to Miami and they've lost, sorry, they've drawn against Diff. No goals in the last two games, but they may have a solution in the transfer market, Jonathan. Yeah, and I think the first thing to say is... Um... Obviously, if you want more bonus content, if you didn't watch our 10 to watches, there's still 19 other players that we've not talked about here that you can go and listen to. Steve, I think we're actually about, I've got a feeling about 50% of those players have left the league. Um, maybe maybe 30 Quite to 40% lot, at left. least. Yeah. Um, there's at least three of my players have left the league on that list, and I'm sure a couple of yours have as well. So, uh, yeah, we've, we're having a successful season on our 10 to watches. So, patreon.com slash Nordic Football Podcast. Of course, um, anything you do subscribe will goes towards the running of the show and helps us sort of cover costs and you know keeps us in fine linen uh steve so i know your um meat pies don't don't come for free so um but yeah no like if you if you're able to obviously you know uh, support us via that patreon you, you do get that extra bonus content we also had a good week on the weekend preview show um two out of two tips correct for me and i think you got a couple right as well so we'll talk about that later maybe in part two but um yeah, I think we need to talk about this transfer. I mean, on the subject of transfers, I mean, the main thing I want to talk about this week, Steve, is the relegation, which we'll come to next. Um, I've got a rant that's been brewing for about four days and I don't want to waste my time talking about uh, the title race this week. I want to get into relegation. But um, Oliver Berg, this is a massive, this is a bombshell, actually. This broke last week. And ironically, Steve, it broke before the Malmo Urgarden game. Uh, for now, for those who don't know Oliver Berg, he was at Kalmar last season again, a bit like Rajevic, really did really well. He played under Henrik Riestrom, who is now the new Malmo manager. And of course, uh, had a really good season. Um, Riestrom went to Malmo, Berg went to Jurgarden. Um, But there was always a bit of a rumour that, you know, Malmo wanted, Riestrom wanted to take him to Malmo. 
and you know why didn't he go and join his sort of um his his former manager there and just seemed a little bit un it just seemed like there was maybe something to come in the future on this one it, 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 but I'm very very surprised to see what's happened here um very badly timed in terms of the move it all broke the day before they played each other um a lot of um a lot of bad blood in this one actually I think uh they, they, they kind of had conversations um, and it, it broke out that, that Berg was in talks with, with Malmo before I think a deal was agreed. Um, the sporting director of, of, of uh, Eurogarden, Boss Anderson, came out and accused um, Henrik Riesdrom of tapping him up. He said, I'm, I'm convinced they were in contact before and, and basically kind of threw some, threw some words at Riesdrom. Uh, Riesdrom didn't really deny it he said you always have contact with players and check how they're doing um and you always exchange he says he says here quote unquote tips and links to tactical articles and things that you pick up oliver is one such player so clearly he's not denying that they've been in contact but maybe he's saying it's more of a, a friendly manner um but obviously i'm sure maybe is there a whatsapp conversation there saying hey fancy coming to malmo um and he said at that time he said he's a your garden player it would be rude for me to talk about him uh but Boss Anderson, you know, was not happy about it. He said, that, listen, I think they've discussed the transfer. Uh, and clearly it's all moved pretty quickly. I don't exactly know. I don't really get it, to be honest, Steve, because I will say that I don't think Berg really ever really looked comfortable at your garden. I always felt that he's, a, he's kind of a false nine and he was playing as like a, as like a kind of a, they played him as like a, at times they played him as like a number 10 behind a, behind a forward. Then obviously they sold Edvardson, they sold um, they sold Bergstrom. Yola Soro has not really played too much this season. They kind of moved him as back into that false nine role, put him on penalties. He kind of had a bit of an impact, but it's never really, it's never just really looked that comfortable in that in that Euro Garden team. I feel I feel like they 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 signed him, but didn't really maybe know exactly where they wanted to play him. That that was the feeling I always got. It was like a, a good player in a team that that was a kind of a four two three one team, and they didn't really want him as a as a 10 because his, his attributes of kind of getting into that penalty area and arriving late into the box and kind of as, as, as a nine, if that makes sense, rather than behind someone. Um, but it got ugly, Steve, this day, did actually. So uh, obviously the two teams played each other. Uh, and um, when, when Jürgen lost to, to EFK Jotterburg a, a week ago, Berg was confronted by his own fans at, at the stadium at Gamla Ulleve after the final whistle. Uh, and it was, got pretty ugly. Um, I know that you're going haven't been in huge, hugely great form lately, um, but yeah, he got a bit of um, he got a bit of gr grief from the from his own fans. I'm not sure if that you know uh, contributed to this move, maybe in some way, or if they maybe knew something was going on. But um, but yeah, basically the, the comments saying that you know he wasn't too happy with what happened. Uh, he was frustrated, and you know he came out and said he wasn't really happy with it. But obviously, part of part of football, he said. Um, but yeah, then then all of a sudden these rumours came out that he's you know he's gonna gonna leave. So it's a bit of a strange one to be honest. I have to say, Steve. And uh, within days, the move was agreed. You were going to put out a statement on their website, and um, he's now a Malmo player. He's made his debut in the Swedish Cup this evening, and and he's gone to Malmo. It never quite felt like the right fit, did it? your garden for a leather bear just didn't and i think this probably will suit him a lot better uh, linking up with his uh, former manager and they need him because you know you know they're three points now off the top of the table no goals in two um you know shout out to Wolfsburg again who seemed to bounce back from adversity quite well you know on the face of it a 2-0 win against Mialbi isn't that impressive but i actually think it is Mialbi just beat um, malmo and uh, although you did say on the, we had a weekend preview show, and you did say that Mialbi do struggle to back up one good result with another one. Um, but Elfsborg still are top of the table. Um, quick shout out on them, just, you know, for again, bouncing back. Yeah, they've done well to bounce back. Uh, but you're, you're not really taking my hint about relegation, are you? I think you're, you're delaying the gratification here, aren't you? Uh, I'm not really interested in talking about the title race this week. So, yeah, good win for them. Well, you know, I just want to, you know, give credit to where where credit is uh, due. Um, no, I'll be fair. I'll, I'll elaborate. It's a bit unfair. I'll be. I'll elaborate slightly. Um, 
I didn't actually see the game, so in some ways I can't comment. They've got some new signings, like Balderson came in, had a decent match. Um, of course, they lost Lagerbilka, so first game without him, and they've kept a clean sheet, which is which is impressive. Um, but yeah, like like I say, Steve, um, there, there's 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 things brewing inside me that I need to get out. So can we move on, please? <laughs> North Ship are in fourth place, by the way. That's just just looking at the table now, my eyes are like, wow. Um, seeing that particular position for them, but we'll have to leave them for another week. Um, although we are talking about the IK game later, aren't we? Uh, well, we do have a question about Norseman actually. Maybe you can dig it out later, but um, we did yeah. have a listener question which I, I would like to maybe touch on. Yeah, okay. Um, right, so let's now move to Hecken against Sirius. Obviously, a match which affects both the top and bottom of the Alsvenskan table. A 3 2 late victory for Hecken. Um, the 95th minute own goal. I, it felt like a big goal to me. I must say, I, tw- I actually tweeted it out a bit later um, myself, and uh, you know, affects both ends of the table. Take us uh, through this match, Jonathan. I know you've got plenty to say about Sirius, and that's going to lead on to like the relegation battle talk um, very soon after that one. But a bit of a wild game. Yes, time for my time for my com- time for my. Um... Well, this has been brewing for a while, to be honest. Now, you might remember, well, for those who follow us on Twitter at Nordic Footpod, I've been making a few comments about Sirius in recent weeks uh, for good justification. Now, I refer you to my tweet on the 31st of July, 24th of July, Steve. Sirius should not be losing this game. They play some very nice football, but they have a very soft centre, inexperience at the back and a lack of grit to get the job done. A decent footballing team, but the way they lose games, they could, the way they lose games that they shouldn't lose, they could well be a candidate to go down 24th of July, 8.02 p.m. Uh, 31st of July, 7.47 p.m. Sirius conceding an 88-minute goal to lose a game they play well in. I am shocked. Now, that refers to, Steve, to the two matches that they played um, against let me just pull up the pull up the games because they are not on a good run at this moment in time, Steve. But that was the game against Mialbi, Steve, where they went one 0 up, two one down, got it back to two two, seventy seventh minute, lost the match. Following week, Steve, thirty first of July, serious AIK played well, did a decent job. Eighty ninth minute, Bilal Hussein strike, lose the game. Following week, they lose one 0 at Ellsborg. Following week, they beat Kalmar 3 0. Um, Stephen, this hacking game, they went 1 0 up. Yuck in person, literally in the second minute of the match. Started really brightly, looked really good. Sadiq got an equaliser. Uh, they went 2 1 up, Matthews. Uh, actually, I don't think it was Matthews. I think it was a cross. Matthews, but, um, Matthews did score, I think. Pretty maybe, sure maybe, he got on the score sheet. He might have been credited a goal, yeah, but I don't think it was actually. I don't think might it have been an score. own goal. Was it an own goal? Yeah. I think he smashed it and it came off someone and bounced into that, right, basically. But right. yeah, he, I mean, he was at the heart of it. Uh, but then, Steve, and Steve, I'm just going to read when they were 2 1 up. Let me just read you my tweet at 2 1 up. 3 19, 20th of August. Sirius are 2 1 up away to Bickle Hacken and playing really well. So a 3 2 defeat in the last 10 minutes is inevitable. Dot, dot, dot. Minutes later, goal, 3 <laughs> 30. 11 minutes later, goal, Hacken, 2-2. A uh, few people tweet laughing and, and sort of just saying, like, surely this is not going to happen, Steve. And then in the 95th minute, as if by clockwork, uh, across into the box, and, and literally your uh, person, or uh, I believe it's person, has battered the ball into his own net, own goal, absolutely smashed it in like Duncan Ferguson at the near post uh, to lose the game 3-2. Now... Steve, this has been brewing in me for, for like, like I said, 24th of July. So this is a good month. I've been saying this, that Sirius could be in serious trouble. And we are now here, Steve. Uh, this is JF football being proven to a degree accurate. Now, I just want to read you a couple of the other results, Steve, they had this season. This is not something that I've just plucked out of thin air. Um, Sirius 3, Elsborg 4, 8th of May, Steve. Elsborg take the lead. Uh, Sirius got 2-1 up. 2 all, 3 2 to Sirius, and then 87th minute, 3 3, 89th minute, Johan Larsen, 4 3, they lose the game. Uh, 
there's so many games, Steve, I could go through. I mean, I, I can I could sit here and name plenty more games. Serious Hammerby, 9th of July. Uh, they go 1-0 down, they equalise, 75th minute, go 2-1 down. Um, I've just mentioned literally five games there, minimum five to six games, Steve. Uh, the only one in their in their favour, 90th minute equaliser at Kalmar, 3rd of May, where they, they pull one back themselves for a change. But every other place, it is literally them conceding late goals, Steve, in games where they've played quite well and then they've thrown it away. Um, and I'm going to say this, Steve, because we are talking about relegation here. I am personally thinking they could get relegated. Now, Steve, I just want to ask you something, right? Do you ever sort of feel like a player can embody uh, a team, if you know what I mean? Like the feeling of a team can be summed up by one player. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. You get that feeling um, yeah. in football, right? Certainly. You look at Patrick Bamford at Leeds. <laughs> you sometimes you know? get one player that sums up a team, right? Now, with the greatest respect to him, I actually like Tash- I like Tashweek Matthews, right? He's in my fantasy team. Um, he's contributed well for me. He gets a decent amount of goal. I think he's actually stepped up a level this season. He's become now a decent forward. But I will tell you something, Steve, that drives me up the wall, right? With ser- And this, to me, is serious in a nutshell, right? Go back and watch Malmo Sirius, okay? 3-0, 1st of July. OK, you think it's a routine win for Sirius this game. Keith Sattel in fifth minute, right? Then he scored in the 47th minute penalty and then Nanasi in the 55th minute. You think to yourself, routine, routine win. But I distinctly remember this game, Steve. Three chances. Um, two of them fell to Tashreek Matthews. One of them where he was clean through on goal, Steve. And he, he missed the chance. And I'll tell you what drives me mad, Steve, sometimes. like Don't, don't get me wrong. I like footballers who, who enjoy the game, right? I like to see joy on people's faces. Tashreek Matthews is a player. Whenever he misses a go, and what you watch it, watch it next time you watch Sirius, keep an eye on this. Whenever Tashreek Matthews misses a chance, he has this big, wide South African grin on his face, as if to say, like, ah, who cares? You know what I mean? Like, it's it's innocent. It's not like a cynical thing. It's innocent. He is actually just maybe a, a fun-loving kind of guy, right? But it's this kind of big toothy grin, like when he misses a, a massive, a big chance, like kind of a smiley. Oh well, it doesn't matter. What shame I didn't score that, you know, like what ah, it's a shame, isn't it? Let's laugh about it. Maybe it's like a nervous laugh, whatever, however you want to put it. But I'm telling you, this this smile of Tashreek Matthews is serious, IK serious football club in a nutshell to me. Because it happens so many times, Steve. The hacking game this weekend just gone. They had chances to go three nil up, three one up, four one up. Matthews himself missed two big chances. And I've seen this smile every time I've seen Sirius play in the last three, four weeks. This kind of like, ah, uh, that was a shame. Could have scored that, but I didn't. Oh, well, that's the breaks. You know what I mean? That kind of just, that kind of just like blasé. It's all a bit of a laugh type thing. Now, I'm not criticising Matthews because actually I think, like I say, he's a fun-loving guy. So I, I do feel a bit harsh picking on him. But just that is, to me, that is serious at this moment in time. It's like playing nice football. Everything's fun and roses. We look good, so everything's great. But at the end of the day, you've lost. Now, it is in massive danger, Steve, of coming back to bite them. Because now, if you look at this table, they are just above the relegation zone. You've got an EF Coyoteborg in a minute, we'll talk about, who are sort of picking up points now. You've got AIK, who are also, you'd expect them to pick up points. Sirius are now 12th, one point above uh, EF Core and in 14th and AIK in 15th. That is the relegation zone. They're one point above it, despite uh, the amount of games they've played so well in and lost. They could easily have a minimum of nine more points than they have currently, 20 points. Um, and when I say about sort of smiling, I don't mean, I'm not criticising smiling, right? Dwight York, for example, was a, a great player for Manchester United who he would always smile. They called him the Calypso kid, right? He always had that grin on his face. And I, I don't mind players who are happy. And I'm not trying to say like everything should be serious, but... The difference is Dwight York had that kind of killer instinct. He was ruthless. When he wasn't obviously out with page three models, he actually had that bit. He had that kind of nastiness that you needed to get the job done. Matthews, for me, sums up where serious are at the moment. Now, listen, if you listen, I hope you don't take offence to this. I know it's innocent from his point of view, but that's just the feeling I get, Steve. It's kind of like they're, sleep, they're basically sleepwalking into relegation. And I, I'm, I urge serious and everyone who listens to this related to serious, 
that they need to kind of wake up to because I think they're walking into it, getting relegated. Yeah, it's very interesting you say about um, because this this is a completely different sport. But my own cricket team, and I don't actually know how many players in my cricket team listen to this podcast. One of our Australian players used to follow it religiously, actually, back in the day. But he it really winds me up if someone gets out of cricket and walks back to the pavilion with a big smile on their face. I would much rather someone comes straight in and literally smashes their bat or helmet against the dressing room door, <laughs> um, as some people do. Because, um, and I know it winds some other people up as well. Um, it almost infers that you don't care as much. It, it, it's the way it comes across. So I know where you're coming from. And Matthew, Matthews is a very frustrating player, isn't he? I've watched him quite a bit. Um, I don't know what is his final finish or decision sometimes can go a little bit wanting, although he's clearly talented. Um, Sirius are interesting side, ranked completely mid-table in terms of the metrics. So they shouldn't be down there um, in terms of the points because their actual XG and XGA puts them as a mid-table side. So something's going wrong, isn't it? And I think they've got, they're one of them teams and every league has them. They seem to struggle in the big moments at both ends of the field. And uh, if you keep getting those moments wrong, it certainly can come uh, back to bite you, can't it? And uh, that league table, like you said now, is starting to be concerning. They've lost, what is it? Five, three, four, five, six of their last eight games. So we we never seem to really give them an awful lot of airtime, do we, on, on the Nordic Football Podcast? But uh, they're getting more than their fair share here. Do you, you believe that they are sliding towards huge relegation trouble? I think they're in, I think they're in massive trouble, Steve. I, th- I think the Hacken game. I mean, if anyone was following us on the Nordic Pod, the, the odds actually at that time when they went to when they were Hacken were two one down, the odds for them to win was seven point four. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that was buying money. I, I tweeted it. I said literally they they will lose this game, and lo and behold, they lost the game. And it wasn't even like a bold prediction. It wasn't even really. I didn't even feel. I didn't even have. A, a, I didn't even have a, a, I didn't even have a centimeter of doubt in my mind that they would lose. Um, and I don't, to be honest, Steve, I don't even. I think if you ask the serious players, I don't. I think they thought they. I still think they thought they would lose when they were two and up. That is what I'm trying to sort of say. Like I feel like it's becoming psychological. I, I feel like they are. I feel like they're losers, in the sense. <laughs> I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to say it, but I feel. I feel like they've got a loser mentality at that club, and I feel like. You, you know, Steve, you get teams who sort of, I'm not criticizing, I don't mean it personally. Like, I'm not saying the players, I'm not, I'm saying the club as, a, as an entity. You, you know, you have clubs sometimes where they get safe and they're like, right, pack, let's pack it in. We, we're job done. Like, we're safe. We're going to be mid table. Like, down nothing's going to really go, thing. nothing's going to go wrong. We don't, we're not going to get into Europe. We're not going to go down. I, I just feel like that's where they are and they're going to, they're going to get caught out because I expect EF Court to get better. I think Degafor's. I've shown signs of life. Um, Vibo probably gone. But, you know, there's another team we're going to talk about in a second who your theory is that you think are heading that way as well. But from my point of view, serious, I just think that they've got a bit of a, that, like the loser mentality is settling in. You know, when they, the own oh goal was the most inevitable thing you've ever seen in your life, Steve, in the 90th, it was just obviously going to, like, you just knew they were going to lose. Like, there's, I don't think anyone in the state, I could, the fans after the game, they did a pan shot to the fans and the fans were just sort of like... <laughs> The fans are just sort of like, <laughs> like shrugging their shoulders in the stand. There was probably about twenty traveling fans. I don't know, maybe a hundred, but I could you could see them just in bucket hats, just sort of shrugging their shoulders, like, well, here we are again. If you know what I mean, like, even they knew they were going to lose. And this is what I'm sort of trying to say, Steve. The Osfan is not a big league where you can sort of get to twelfth like the Premier League and just just chill. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's not kind of Netflix and chill when you're when you're twelfth place in in Osfan. If you're not careful, you you can get sucked into it. And I, I genuinely think, I mean, it's only one point now, so this isn't even a hot take. They're massively in trouble. They need to wake up and start seeing out games um, because if they don't, they'll be relegated. And and the reason I'm saying this, Steve, like with a bit of passion and, and urgency, um, you know, Matthews is 22 years old. I think he can go on and actually have a decent career. I think he could go higher. I could easily see him in, for example, the Netherlands, our favourite league, um, or somewhere else, if you know what I mean. I, I could see him. He's got a good career in it. They've got a lot of players, Steve, where I'm like, you're, you're actually a decent player. They're a good team and they play nice football, Steve. They're entertaining to watch. This manager, um, Matheson, who's come from, from a Poikina, of course, he's the man who took over from Sean Constable 
uh, and got them back to back promotions uh, with Roma Poikina. And then obviously he's taken a serious job. And and they play nice football, Steve. They, they, they pass it around. They outplayed Hacken for a good 60 minutes in that game. Now, I don't know if it's fitness. I don't know if it's kind of just, like I say, lack of self belief, loser mentality. But there's something in their mind psychologically, or maybe it's just fitness wise, that, that is not allowing them to see out games. And I think it's a real shame because, like I said, they actually outplayed Hacken. Hacken got very lucky in that match, in my opinion. Uh, it could have easily gone like 4 1 or something that serious. And that is why I'm injecting that urgency because I'm saying, you, you guys play nice football and you don't really deserve a lot of these defeats. Um, but they are getting, they're racking them up every single week, basically. So, um, yeah, I think they could go down, Stephen. I'm actually, I'm actually leaning towards thinking they will go down because they lack that sort of, um, they lack that grit that you need sometimes to just grind out a couple of results to get out of it, out of trouble. Um, but moving on, of course, you've got another team who you think are in massive trouble in Osvenc going to go down. Yeah, I can hear some of the serious fans and serious players listening to this and and literally uh, thinking, you cannot be serious. <laughs> I think that we, we decided on the title of the episode of this uh, uh, podcast uh, several days ago, uh, sounding a bit like John McEnroe, that, John McEnroe there. But uh, let's just talk about this, this relegation battle then. And um, I mean, it's still two big clubs in that bottom three. Barberg, we think, are gone 11 points. They're not coming back from that. ARK and EF Core on 19 points each, but both sides have shown signs of improvement recently, especially EF Core in terms of wins. Probably got to think both sides will, with 10 games left, probably find a way out of that bottom three. Dega Fours, we know, have, have got their issues, 20 points, but they, I've, I've, I have seen a lot more fight from them of late, I must say. They're actually getting bodies on the line a lot more than they were, they were doing at the start of the season. Then we've got Sirius on 20. We've talked about them. Halmstad, they're the team that I'm massively worried about. And I think they're really fortunate that they've got 25 points, which is a night that is a that's crucially six points above danger right now because they are free falling. They're one of them teams who I look at, and I I think of their last 10, they're probably going to lose seven or eight of their last 10 games. They're that, they're that bad right now. I don't know what's going on at Halmstad behind the scenes, but it all seemed to start when they lost 5-0 at home to Varberg. And, you know, the goalkeeper retired after that match. I mean, who the hell loses 5-0 at home to Varberg anyway? Um, at the time, we were thinking, you know, is it a one-off? Is it a fluke? They've since lost 3-0 at Malmo. OK, we'll let them off that. 3-1 at home to Norshipping and then 3-1 against Bromma Boykina. So they're not just losing games. They're conceding a lot of goals. I've looked at their metrics and they're not good. They have the worst average XG per 90 minutes in Alsvenskan, 1.85. And they also have the second worst expected goals scored in Alsvenskan at 0 0.98. 0 0.98 per match, only Kalmar is worse. So metrically, they, they're they probably the worst team in the league. And you know, they're sitting there in, what is it, 14th, 11th place. I, I think there's a massive chance that they could end up in the playoff. That's where, that's where I see them right now. And that's, of course, where they went down uh, before when they're in the league. So are you concerned about Hamstash form yourself? Do you think, could you see them getting sucked into it or have they got enough of a buffer? It's a strange one with Hamstash because I, I agree with everything you're saying almost pretty much. But uh, I think you're onto something when you say that there might be something going on behind the scenes there. Actually, I hadn't, I hadn't really considered it. But now that you kind of mention it, I'm starting to think about it. And I'm like, you know what? You could be right. Um, funnily enough, there were some quotes a couple of weeks ago uh, when it was announced that Nilsson Sakefister was sort of pausing his career um, due to sort of mental health problems. And Magnus Haglin said that it had been an emotional, a Hampstead coach basically came out and said it's been an emotional week. It was a shocking week for us. Um, he opened up about it and said, he was pretty honest, actually. He said, uh, Malcolm's a figurehead in some way and a very important player and person in our group. Um, the fact that he's taken a break was unexpected for me and his teammates. He's been walking alone with dark thoughts um, and stuck together based on the person he is. But in the end, it was too much for him. Um, it's been a hard week. It really has been. And, yeah, I don't know, Stevie. He, he is a massive character in the dressing room, I think, you know, and maybe maybe it's kind of like 
you know, some of the comments he made, he kind of said, you know, we all walk around with demons and dark thoughts and it can become dark. It become it can become very dark and it can linger for a long time. And Malcolm had a long and tough day in that match. And, and it almost feels like that was break. Maybe that was like breaking point of his career. And he just decided after that, like, like it feels like quite ugly, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, this is a bit trivial, maybe a little bit. Um, it's pr probably it is probably a bit trivial to say, but. It almost, it almost feels like you know when you, it kind of. I know it's a serious topic, but it kind of reminds me of like the Undertaker for WrestleMania when he kind of, when his career was ending. If you know what I mean, there, there were comments about how, like how difficult it is to sort of like carry on when you know you're ending something. If that makes sense. Um, and I just imagine him there when they lost five 0 maybe probably just standing there on the goal line, just thinking, "I'm done." Do you know what I mean, Steve? You just have a breaking point where it's like that's it's over for me. I'm done with this. And if you were like a big character in the dressing room probably quite hard to come out and, and be brave enough to do that mid-season so I, I can't I can kind of like now that you've mentioned it and I actually thought about it and looked into it Steve and seeing these comments it does actually make me realize yeah you're probably right um not something I'd considered I mean you know just just going back to serious you know as a comparison Steve you know statistically just take a couple of their games recent recent games which alludes to what I was saying uh, the game against AIK, Sirius XG was 1.85. AIK's XG was 0 0.86. Uh, the week before that, the 24th of July, that I mentioned, Sirius's XG in that match was 3.19. Uh, Meowbees was 2.64, and Sirius lost that game 3-2. You, you can clearly see what the issue is there, right? They're, they're not capitalising on their chances they're creating. Hamstad are a complete reverse. Like They're not creating anymore. Gwyneth was doing so well up front, he's, he's kind of gone off the boil. I expected Hamstad to start to somehow climb out of this, actually, but now you've alluded to it, you, you could start to worry. I mean, they've got Varnum away coming next, then they've got Sirius at home. That's a massive game, in my opinion. I think the loser of that game is 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 almost nailed on bottom four. Um, and then they've got Hacken away, Ellsborg, Eurogarden away. Now, you know, by 7th of October, Steve, with five games to go, they could be in serious, well, they could be in real trouble. Uh, serious are the ones who are serious trouble, but I think Hamstad could be almost going Homestad to the Super Etten, if you know what I mean. So um, I think these are two teams where we've looked at EF Core, we've looked at AIK, and we've sort of looked at them with a bit of a beady eye, Steve, and been like, are they too big to go down? And by the way, I do would like to just briefly talk about AIK, if that's all right. But um, yeah, I think Hamstad and the Sirius, they, they need to kind of wake up because the problem with Hamstad, they have a really small squad, and I don't think they've got the resources really to recruit. So losing a keeper like that is it can have a massive, even just psychologically, but also in terms of just personnel, Steve. I'm not sure they have the, the squad to really get out of it. And um, yeah, in, in my opinion, just to, just to wrap up what I'm trying to say, Steve, before we maybe could move on to AOK, I don't think anyone's safe uh, from. I, I don't even think Kalmar are safe. If you look at if you look at the table, I think the only teams that are safe are Mialbi and up. I think Mialbi will be fine. Every other team, in my opinion, is open open test. I think Varnamo will be fine, but points wise, 25 points. You know, relegation zone starts at 19 points. So I wouldn't even say they're safe. Goran Poikino, I don't think, are guaranteed. Um, Kalmar losing Radjevic. Where are they going to get goals from? So I think I think I think we're in for a really interesting relegation battle. Actually, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I was looking at these fixtures for Halmstad and. Uh... You know, this one against Varnamo looks a tough one, um, certainly to win. And then that big game just before the international break, <clears throat> Halmstead against Sirius. I, I I will definitely hang my hat on this one. Whoever loses that is in massive trouble. You know, could well go down. Could well go down. So, yeah, you worry about them. Uh, still, let's say the two big clubs down there, IK and uh, if Core. Now, I watched that game on Monday night live, Norship against AIK. Um, what do you make of their survival chances right now? Yeah, I think this is this is rant number two. Um, actually, it's not even really a rant. Another rant? No, it's not. It's not. It's not even a rant. Actually, it's a question. <laughs> um, what exactly, Steve, has Henningberg done at AIK? Now, yeah. he's a legend, of course, a treble winner. Good manager, in my opinion. He's, he's he's sort of had a decent managerial career. He's been in Poland, been in Cyprus. He's had a degree of success. But like you, Steve, I watched this match and I actually got to about I actually got to about sixty minutes of this game and I started thinking, what what? Everybody's sort of thinking, hey, okay, they're going to be fine. Um, 
and they're too good to go down. And I actually got to about 60th minute. And I was like, you know what? They're not, this is not a good football team. Are they, Steve? They're not actually a good football team. Um, and that is just the basic facts. Uh, and, you know, you sort of sometimes with a big club, you're like, you're, wait, you're just waiting for them to get out. You know what I mean? The fairy tale story, they'll pick it up. They'll, they'll, they'll pick up the points. They've made a few transfers. And I just watched this match. They took, obviously took the lead early. Modesto with a, a really good goal. He had another chance, actually, where they could have gone 2-0 up. And I was thinking, they're going to they're gonna romp it here. And then they just they just suffer from the like the Mr. Bojangles, don't they, Steve? They, they just suffer from nerves. And I got very they, frustrated with this game. I'm they're a, I'm really open. They're a really open team. Uh, you can cut through them like a knife through butter. And the other part of it, Steve, is they they can't, they can't defend. So he hasn't improved them really defensively. I don't think in a massive way. And they can't attack. They get into the final third, and they're like, what? It's like watching a non-league team, in my opinion, or a League Two team. Like they they. Their final third actions are just not they're just not good enough um to be considered a, a sort of good team in my opinion they, they do make quite a lot of penalty box entries uh or final third entries sorry but they just they just i mean they, what berg's done is he's basically put two fullbacks as wingers he's put otieno from left back to left wing and he's put modesto from right back to right wing but neither of them is really a, a, a wide player if you know what i mean in the traditional sense of the modern game you know in a 4-3-3 type thing or 4-4-2, which is what they tend to play. And it was really clear watching Otieno, for example, when he gets into that final third, there was one there was one moment, Steve, he got, he got down the byline, really good attacking opportunity. He just booted the ball nearly 50 yards out of play. You know, cross was just wildly over, over hit. And um, that's when I started thinking, you know what, they're not actually, they don't, there's no link up play in the, in the box kind of thing. Um, and then if you if you dig deeper into it, Steve, like what have the signings done? You know, Basirovic did very very little. Um, he's not really. You know, there was all this talk. I, I read I read some comments saying he's going to be like he's going to turn their whole season around um, type thing. He's barely done anything. They've got the issue. You know, he didn't even he came on at half time obviously, but he didn't do much. Um, Guidetti as is injured, and there's actually rumours that he might be thinking of halting his career. I don't know if they're true, but you know, he got injured in a cup game and Guidetti's not really even had a massive impact. I don't even think it really registered that much, but, you know, he's a legendary figure in Sweden in terms of his his contributions, obviously winning the under 21 Euros. He was part of that that famous side with Lindelof and, and others, but really kind of went out with a bit of a whimper. Remember when he came back home to such fanfare, he's almost been forgotten about a little bit. Pitas, he's, he's come in, he's not really, he, he scored, I know he scored early on, but not had a massive impact. Um, Ty Chosen at right back was taken off at half time in this game. Um, they've sold Robin Tihi to Saudi Arabia, which I thought was a really strange move. Uh, player I really like, talked about him a lot, but they they, they look a bit light in defence. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think like I just came out of that match thinking, you know what 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 has actually Henningberg changed um, for the better? And he, he came out and said it was one of our better games actually after the match. He said he's 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 happy with how they played. And to me, that's almost even more alarming, Steve, because I thought North Shopping were the better side. And, you know, North Shopping having a really good season. We had a comment, actually, from... Um, don't know if you managed to find this, Steve, so bear with me a minute. But we had a comment from a, a listener on Twitter, at Nordic Footpod, that said... Uh, I actually think... I'm just getting his handle. Jack Hacken, at, uh, at, at Companator, he said... North Shopping is the most underrated team in Osvenskan, period. Um, and I actually agree with him on that. I think I think they've, they've had a really good season and uh, they, they kind of, in the end, dispatched AOK pretty comfortably to leave them in the bottom two. It, this game frustrated me a hell of a lot. I was talking to you on Monday night. I actually lost an in-running overs bet in this game at 3-1. I took over... Over 4.75, and I don't lose many in running overs, I must say. Uh, but I stupidly relied on AIK actually having composure in front of goal, which they didn't have any. I agree with you. I think it's all mental. This squad shouldn't be in the bottom three at all. Um, there's enough quality there, but they're not showing their quality because they're getting um, they're getting too panicky. They're snatching at chances. They're creating opportunities, I think, and, and there's a good energy about them. I actually thought they were, I actually thought they were the better team, but it was Norshipping who showed more more quality on the ball. Troutersen, he's having a great season. 
Um, so their manager was saying that he thinks he's been the, the best midfielder in Osvenskin this season. Um, Lind had a great free kick. So Norshipping's extra quality was the difference. Uh, AIK need to find a way to uh, harness that quality they have on paper. And that's up to Berg, isn't it, really? He needs to get the best out of them in that respect. They've got some good, they've got some favourable home games, though, before the, uh, in the last 10 games. And that, that might be the difference. But they need to, yeah, it, men, it's, football is so hard, isn't it? Sport is so hard. Mentally, if they can just sort themselves out in that capacity, um, because they're just a bit too panicky, I feel, at the moment. Yeah, I would agree. And um, I, I'm not sure. I don't know if the pen, the, the thing for me, Steve, I don't know if the, I don't know if the penny will drop. I'm, I'm waiting for it to drop. I'm thinking who's who's actually going to who's actually going to drag them out of this. And I don't I don't see I don't see many players that I think, oh, yeah, you're going to they, they give me a bit of a Leeds vibe, actually, last like last season. I just look at them and it's like they've got good players. But I, I'm looking at it and I'm like, if you look at Leeds when they went down, you had Somerville, you had Nonto, but the two young to be like the fulcrum of the team to drag them out of this. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I see similarities with sort of some of the younger players they have that are good, but they're not, you know, Bilal Hussein, for example, he's experienced enough now, but it's like, can he drag them out of relegation battle? The senior players are kind of letting them down. Jimmy Dumas hasn't done much. The centre-backs have been poor, in my opinion, this season, not, not up to their normal level. Um, the strikers, you know, you've got Guadetti now, no longer there. Pitas has just come into the league. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at the team. I'm like, who's going to... Even Otieno, who was... It seems like maybe even his window of getting a big move is, is sort of 50-50 now. You, I, I just... I'm surprised he's still in the league. And I feel like his stock's gone down this season in terms of the performance levels. So it's like, even him, you know, you're looking to him to maybe drag them out of this. But I'm like, is, you know, Modesto's new to the league. I'm shrugging my shoulders. Thinking, who's going to drag them out of this? I mean, they got Viber boys at home this weekend. You'd think that's a routine win, but... Who's gonna? Who? Which player is gonna drag them out of this? The big game? problem, right, is the is the goal scoring. So metrically speaking, they're the biggest underachieving side in Alsvenskan. They've got an xG per game of one point five two, which is the sixth best of any any side, and yet their goals for per game is zero point nine five. So that is more than more than half a goal underachievement in front of goal. Now that is terrible. So exactly, but then, but who, who's gonna the, but who's gonna well, drag them the, out of it? Well, someone needs to start finishing these chances. So, who? Well, well, that's that's a, that's the question, isn't it? And <laughs> that's what I mean. I, why so, are they not buying? Why are they not getting? Why are they not buying a reliable striker in this transfer? I think window? they'll be in the market. I think, I think, I think by this time next week, I'd imagine they'd, they'd get one or two more in. But th that's kind of the point I'm making. So if you look at EF Core, for example, I don't think we'll have time to talk about them this week. But big derby, obviously coming up this weekend against um, Hacken. That's a massive match. And the Degerfors, we haven't even talked about Degerfors EF Core yet. You know, the huge win for EF Core that late on uh, after going 1-0 down against Degafors. Um, you can't emphasise what a big win that is. And they've got the new players now. They've got Selmani. Berg started to score again. You're looking at EF Core and you're thinking, Marcus Berg is going to drag them out of this, right? Selmani, maybe you'll get a few goals. Um, they've got, and you, I'm start, you look at EF Core and I'm thinking that some, they, someone will drag them out of that. But I'm looking at AIK and thinking, who, who, who's actually going to drag them out of this? You know, I would argue that maybe... Um, I'd argue that sort of if you look at Varnamo or a, or a, or a, or a, someone like that, they're, they're more reliable than this AIK team. So, yeah, I think the fans won't like it, but I, I, I don't think they're out of this by any stretch of the imagination. I think Henning Berg's got a lot of work to do, to be honest, because I don't really feel like I feel like he's had enough games now. It's probably coming up to about ten games um, to really put a stamp on this team, and I don't I don't really see the direction. Yeah, the player to get them out of it might not be at the club right yet. Is, is probably a good answer there, but they need to, yeah, they need to sort out their goal scoring problems. I think we may have to is, uh, finish it for Sweden for this section. We're kind of running out of time. I don't know if there's anything you want to add before we go into the break, Jonathan, but uh, yeah, a very interesting discussion about this bottom of the table battle. No, we've, we've still got a lot to talk about. Actually, we've got Europe, we've got Norway. Um, only one final little bit of um, business. It looks like Ibrahim Sadiq might have played his last game for Hakan. Uh, Hakan, that squad is getting revolved around at the moment. He looks to be off to young boys, Burn, and obviously Christopher Lund's already left the league. He's gone to gone to Italy. I think it, is it Paloma? Can't remember exactly. Yeah, but Paloma. He's uh, he's left the league. They've already resigned his replacement. But <clears> um, yeah, big changes back at the top. We'll, we'll talk about the you know Reddit. The, we talk about the league. Who's going to win the league every week? So I feel like this week it was good to have a relegation discussion. Some of the teams that don't maybe get so much um, 
airtime on this podcast. You know, you you got to mix up a bit in life, Steve. So uh, hmm. hopefully that was useful. And it's definitely got a few things off my chest. Yeah, well, you were definitely a man who uh, doesn't have quite so much on his shoulders heading into the break. Uh, we will be talking about the European action that's been going on uh, so far uh, in the last week or two, some big matches in the Champions League, Conference League upcoming as well, and uh, a little bit of a talk about Elite Serie as well. So join us after the break. Welcome back to the Nordic Football Podcast. I'm Steve Wiss and I'm with a much rejuvenated Jonathan Faduba now after his serious and uh, bottom of the table our Svenskan rant. We're now going to talk We're gonna talk about the European uh, matches, teams involved in Europe from Norway and Sweden and Champions League, Molde against Galatasaray. And unfortunately, I actually didn't see the first leg. I was... Hitting up the golf course as I often do this time of year with my, with, with my dad this evening, uh, but Jonathan, you were were covering for me and um, you had your eye on this fixture. Bit of a wild game at the Arca Stadion first leg. Tell us about how it went. Yeah, roving reporter there, Steve, covering your golf playing. You know the things I do for this for the things I do for the listener. Uh, you know what a tough life watching having to watch Champions League football. <laughs> <laughs> on the HD TV, so yeah, no, uh, world's smallest violin, but um, yeah, no, to be honest, I really enjoyed this game to be fair. Uh, Molder Galatasaray, we talked about it last week, we had a bit of a preview, Steve. You gave your thoughts, and uh, I know that obviously Leeds and Galatasaray is always uh, historically a bit of a touchy subject, so I know I know exactly who you wanted to win this match, um, but yeah, good game actually, really enjoyed it. Uh, it finished. Molder 2, Galatasaray 3. The goals were scored by... Uh, Molder actually took the lead, Martin Ellingson, uh, with a nice header. And Molder started really well. They looked really in control of the game. It looked like, you know, maybe they, they were really up for this one, actually. I was surprised. Um, but goals from Oliveira, massively deflected free kick, Steve. I mean, it was not, wasn't going anywhere near in. And a uh, huge deflection. Then a piece of magic from Mauro Icardi. That's what you get when you've got a player who's... You know, how many millions of pounds has he been traded for in, in the past sort of 10 years? Um, you know, he's had, he's had his off-field problems, but you could see on a day, I mean, I guess it's kind of why he's at Galatasaray, you know, maybe off-field stuff has overtaken his on-field stuff, but real bit of class volleyed into the net 2-1. And then Galatasaray sort of started to control the game. I would love to see the XG flow of this match, you know, on a sort of a, a Y-Scout chart or, a, you know, the stats for it, because it, it really ebbed and flowed. It was a game where Mulder were in control, Galatasaray took control. Mulder took control. Galatasaray took control. Uh, Haugen equalised. Lovely um, left-footed shot. Um, 2-2 just after half-time, 56th minute. But Steve, it, and ironically, had to be a Norwegian. Frederick Mids, Midsjö, I believe he pronounced it. Former Rosenborg man. Uh, he came on the field, Steve, in the 82nd minute to booze from the Mulder fans. I guess they, I guess that rivalry, more the Rosenborg, is still alive because he, he came on to booze and everyone was one. I was thinking... Why are they booing a Norwegian player? Um, clearly, obviously, looked into his history and realised. And who popped up 93rd minute to score the winner? But Mitch so, uh Some great play from McCarty. Actually, Steve, the, the mistake here came from um, one of the centre-backs. I can't remember who it was. Uh, but, yeah, it was Bjorn back, I think. He he looked, he's 31 years old and he looked he looked tired. It was a ball over the top and McCarty just got the better of him. He just looked like he was a bit fatigued and McCarty was very like a pickpocket, you know, just sneaked in, nicked the ball uh, and just squared it to um, Mitch Soffer, a tapping essentially, and to win the game. So really disappointed for Mulder, but uh, there were a lot of comments on Twitter, people saying, I mean, we had caught one comment uh, from a, a follower called, uh, sorry, Ramon Vega to at Tony HBA, who said, Mulder always that organised and confident with the ball. They played exceptionally well. So, um, let me ask you that, Steve, because to be honest, I was really impressed with Mulder. Yeah, this match actually oh, caught the highlights, played out exactly as I predicted. 
I um, I was on a show this week and I made an advocate for backing the goals. Where a lot of people fancied the unders based on recent results from both teams, but I had a feeling it would be end to end. Um, both sides are often serious favourites in most fixtures they play domestically, so I think it did them both good to be, you know, in this balanced sort of game. And um, yeah, it sounds like Modder have been very unlucky. Twenty-two shots, just six on target. That can be a problem for them. They're a bit snatchy. Uh, but Icardi really is the one true, real classy player on that field, isn't he? And it sounds like he's kind of been the difference maker today. Are they always that organised? No. But I think they they can't be underestimated in Europe because when they are, like I say, sort of more of an underdog and less fancied, then um, they have a decent track record under this manager as well. And they're going to be... Um, they're going to be a handful, probably for teams in, in the Europa League group now, because I mean, I, I, they're not going to, they're not going to turn that around. Are they, they you know, they're not going to go Turkey and win. If they do that, then I feel like I'll do some sort of forfeit for them. Um, but you eat, yeah, eat a whole Turkey. <laughs> I don't know what I'll do, but that would be some, that would be sensational, wouldn't it? So I think, but I think maybe that's, they knew they had to win this game. So I can't blame them for going for it. And uh, you know, encouraging performance going ahead, going forwards, really, for for Mulder. And um, well, let me ask you the question: Why are they so unpredictable? Because that's that's the question mm, from. It's a very good question. Myth, yeah, at Smithco mm. eighty nine, he said, "Any idea why Mulder is so unpredictable this season compared to last? Mm. Even just total goals in their games, they seem to be either zero or hundred, no in between." That's a really good question, and I've been kind of head scratching myself about it recently. You've got to. You've got to pick the matchups. I think team, you know, what I think teams are starting to realize against Mulder the ones who kind of sit back, park the bus. Teams did this in Europe against them last year. I think Genk were one of them, or was it Ghent? I always get mixed up there. Um, and uh, um, teams that make themselves hard to break down for straight Mulder. Wallerenga did that at the weekend. It was a good tactical game plan from Gerbacker. And I think if you are willing to defend and have got some defensive resistance, then it, it can be stifled. So that could be a possible explanation. They haven't been as clinical in both boxes this year, as in individual mistakes have cost them defensively. And I think in attack, they've missed crucial chances at key moments compared to last year. Like they were, they were a machine last year. This year, it's been more ups and downs but um it is wild inconsistency yeah you're absolutely right about it but let's also remember during this period they've been it's been a brutal qualifying campaign that they, they were taken to extra time by ki hjk gave them two tough games so that also could be why the results are fluctuating domestically for, for Mulder. let's look at um the other games now Mm -hmm. I mean, you've just said there that you'll literally eat a whole turkey live on live on air on YouTube if um, they turn it around. So I, I'm pretty sure you know. I'm pretty sure we can guess who you think will win the next game. Um, do you give Mulder any chance percentage wise? You know, just in the sense that like, what percentage chance do you think they have of winning of, of overturning it? Qualifying. Um, it's got to be probably below, probably ten percent or below now, right? I mean, they've got to win in ninety minutes at least. Even that might not be enough because you've got extra time, possibly penalties. Turkey's a tough place to go. I said on the last podcast that I think Turkish football's on the rise again. I think there's better players in this league now. Um, you know, I was looking at the Conference League fixtures. Fenerbahce here at home against Twente. I know who your money will be on in that one. Um, but the Turkish league is improving. So I'm just pleased that Mulder have given a good account of themselves because they were disappointed against HJK. They were disappointed against KI. And I think it's good that on the big... Because these playoff games, a lot of people watch them. I think it's good that they've um, put their... You know, shown people what they can do. And if it was to be Europa League groups, let's let's hope they get a big team in there, you know? Get a really yeah, big I have club to say it. as well on that. Um, I think they've done Norwegian football in a fantastic light there, actually. I, I, I tuned mm. in just expecting them to get bad. Didn't expect them to yeah. put up such a fight, and I think I think it actually reflects well on Norwegian football. I have to say, I thought it right. was. Um, it made me sit up and think. You know what? Especially with the Hearts Rosenborg as well last week. I know they weren't. Um, I know maybe they just missed out, but 
I thought both games I sort of came out of them feeling like, you know what, Norway and Norwegian football's not in too bad a place. Um, yeah. So fair play to Molda, and I, they didn't deserve to lose, to be honest. It's really unlucky. Yeah. But um, I hope they, you never know. You never know next week. Let's see what they can do. In, yeah, football's a funny Turkey. game. You, you never know. But uh, tough, tough ask. But let's move on to the other two matches, Steve. What we did briefly preview these last week, but I mean, do you have any? Let's put it this way: Do you have any further thoughts or predictions for Brand AZ Alkmaar and Glimp Sepsi? Is there any sort of team news that we need to be aware of, or anything that's changed your mind since um, those draws were made and confirmed? Well, what I have done is I've done a bit more research on the Romanian club Sepsi, um, who finished sixth in the Romanian league last year, but qualified for this uh, Conference League via, by winning the Romanian Cup. This is a club that was only formed in the year 2011 and it achieved promotion to the top tier in six years by quickly climbing through the Romanian league system. Um, they, they they seem like a very interesting club, 8,400 capacity stadium. Um, I haven't actually looked if, if this match is going to be played at that stadium, uh, so that's bad on me, but... Um, it's going to be, this is a big, big match for Sepsi, you know, against Buda Glimt. Um, they're going to be bang up for it. it. It feels like the sort of place that you probably don't want to be traveling to, actually. Um, although over two legs, Glimt should really get it, get, have enough against um, a team that's finished sixth in Romania, shouldn't they? Um, so I, I shouldn't see them having any problems overall. But the first leg might be one of those banana skins where even a draw might not be the biggest shock in the world. AZ Bran. Well, this is one of those games where Bran, I think, just need to take their chances when it comes. I mean, AZ Outmar are... What do we class them as? Because, I mean, I watched PS3. We've had this discussion about... We seem to have this discussion about Dutch teams every week, don't we? But I watched PSV against Rangers. And I, I, I quite like what I saw from PSV. They looked a, a decent team. But then we see, we see other Dutch sides who perhaps are not quite so strong. Alkmaar, I don't know what category to put them in. They're, they're sort of, they're often right on the coattails, aren't they? The big three, and then sometimes drop down. I, I think there will be a tougher test for Brandon Aruka, though. So this is they, they're going to need, like they're going to need Aza to miss some chances. The goalkeeper's going to have to have a good game. They're going to have to be completely clinical. So I, did I say on the last show I had a good feeling Brand might go through? I think I did, didn't I? I'm not sure about that now. <laughs> I've had more time. More time I think about it, my head's taken over. That realistically, AZ out. I should be getting past Brown over two legs, but my heart would like to see Brown go through. Yeah, we've talked a lot about Brown this season. You know, they're riding the crest of a wave. Maybe it's just fallen off a little bit, but sh- should be an interesting mm-hmm. game that one. Uh, don't know if it's on TV in the UK. I'm just checking out now to see, but. No, I don't think it is. But uh, Alkmaar themselves, just in terms of recent form, they're in really great form. They won the last five on the, in a row. Um, I think that includes friendlies, though. No, actually, it doesn't. It doesn't include friendlies. Oh, it does include. F- no, it just. Well, they've had a good start in the league. They beat Golden yeah. Eagles five uh, one, Valvik three one. But that's that yeah. league for you. You know, there's so many goals in that league. Nobody can defend at all. Um, so I think. I mean, my, in my one. opinion, I think AZ are a slightly higher ca- higher category. Um, mm. I think they're kind of between, they're sort of between that big three. Well, they're in no PSV, man's land, aren't they? PSV, they're kind yeah, of on their own. But they're not, they're not as bad as maybe some of, not bad, they're not bad teams, but you know, they're not, I think they're maybe not quite PSV or top the big three, but they're maybe a little bit above the others. Um, mm. In terms of player quality, anyway, I think they've got some decent players. I think all guards are right. And there's one or two others. Um, prediction, you think, you think, Brad, you think, you think you still got a sneaky feeling Brown, but you're 50-50. You're yeah, I think the I think there's going to be goals in both legs. I could see something like three one to maybe AZ in the first leg, um, and maybe Bran could nick a win in the second leg, like two one. So I mean, I, look, I'll say AZ now overall on aggregate, but I think Bran it can be plucky, can keep it close. One thing I will say is that the elite Serian fixtures, none of those teams involved in Europe are playing this weekend, so the league has given them the week off. I got I got this wrong. It was, I got the wrong week basically on the last show. Um, so you know, everyone's going to have a whole week to prepare for the second leg, which is that's that's that does help. They're giving the, all these teams the best possible chance to qualify for the next um round of uh, fixtures. So let's see how that goes. And uh, you know, obviously, reason will go out, but there's still three teams left from Norway, one left in Sweden that's Hecken, Hecken against Aberdeen. 
Um, home favourite here, I noticed uh, for the first leg, quite a, an easy uh, home favourite, actually. Anyone who watched <laughs> who watched Hibs against uh, Villa um, tonight might be thinking, oh, what sort of state is Scottish football in? I thought Hearts were quite good last week. But um, this is an interesting one. We, we briefly talked about it last week. Um, are you, quick, are you, any more to add on your prediction for Heck and Aberdeen? To be honest, I don't, I don't know what way this is going to go. I really I don't know a huge amount about Aberdeen. Um, but what I will say is, you know, you just talked there about Scottish football. We've 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 had I've had three sample samples of it in recent weeks. We've had the Hearts game where I came out with thinking, you know, what Scottish football is doing quite mm, well. Yeah, uh, Rosenborg, Hibs Villa, where it's the most convincing win I've seen all season. I mean, it's early season, but it's the most convincing win I've seen. That made you realise the level of the Premier League is just so high, isn't it? They play a full strength team and absolutely blew away Hibs. Rangers PSV, Steve, where I thought I thought Rangers put in a good fight, and I thought to myself, you know what, P- Rangers are a decent level um, against the sort of decent PSV team. It's very interesting, isn't it, comparing these sort of like quote unquote minor leagues sort of Scotland, Rangers, Sweden, uh, sorry, Scotland, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway. Um, it's, it's it's fun. I, I quite enjoy it actually, just trying to figure out the levels and who's, you know, who's where. Um, my, my gut feeling tells me Hacken are gonna gonna win this, but but I do feel like if Aberdeen have the sort of physicality that the Hearts did, um, or Rangers do, then I think that could catch out Hacken because I, I do feel like if there's one weakness for Hacken, I feel like the midfield is it's not lightweight. Like Rigo and the Gustafsson twins are, are very very good technical players. But I think if there's an advantage for Aberdeen, it's, it's in the fact that I, f- I feel like they could fit from the games I've seen. I think the physicality of Rangers and Hearts impressed me against Rosenborg and, and PSV. And I just feel like, could that maybe be the one stumbling block maybe for Hacken in terms of that? They, if you let them play football, then you're in a bit of trouble, even though they've got a completely almost new squad now. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, that ruggedness maybe of the Scottish Premier League, is that maybe going to come back and, and, and maybe bite? Uh, hacking a little bit, who have had a lot of games lately, and you know they're, as I said to you against in that serious match, I did I thought they got a little bit lucky really to win that. Um, so, yeah, the first leg, Steve, is is it's in Aberdeen, isn't it? So no, first yeah. leg's in Hacken, Hacken at home. Yeah, that's right. So leg. first leg at Bravida. So I feel like Hacken could take an, a lead into the second leg. I think they need to actually. I think they need mm. to win the, the game. Um, but I really put it as 50-50, Actually, I don't. I lean slightly towards Hacken, but I think I'd need to watch Aberdeen a bit more. And hopefully I'll get to do that um, if this game is televised. It's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? That um, the the losers get a place in the Conference League, which is not the end of the earth, is it? So it doesn't feel like the stakes are perhaps as high in this. In, you'd say it was a Conference League qualifier. Winner goes through, loser gets nothing. Uh, at least there is a consolation prize for both. And you could even argue that it both would be better off being in the Conference League. More chance well, of wins yeah, and I stuff. Mean, how can so, they never been in a group stage? So I think mm. they're kind of like, either way, they're buzzing. Uh, yeah. Literally those bees. And then they've got a big derby on on on, on, Sat- on Sunday. So it's, it's, it's a tough time for the, that game to fall. Interestingly, yeah. what you said about the Norwegian League sort of allowing the teams a week off. I, I saw that Galatasaray also having their game cancelled at the weekend. So they've got another week to prepare. Um, as well, which is something that's I think a good idea actually, really for um, these teams. Doesn't seem like it's it's filtered through to Sweden. Yeah, um, it should, really. so yeah, interesting talking point there. But let, let's move on, Steve. We've got a few more minutes on the show before we need to to wrap things up. Yeah. Um, a few little bits and pieces to round off. Uh, I mean, we've got Glimpse Epsi. Do you want to just give your prediction for that quickly? Yeah, I've Glimpse four Glimp one on through. aggregate for me. I think Lim will go through. So let's look at the um, the latest round in the latest Serian. I did want to ask you a fancy question, but I think we're running out of time a little bit um, because there's only four games this weekend. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't have a clue what to do in fantasy because I've I've not got any chips left. It's where you yeah. need a free, like a free hit, don't you? In um, in, in FPL, you'd because... play your rich uncle, would you, if you had it? Yeah, I would if I still had the rich uncle. I would, but I think most have used that chip up already. Um, yeah, from previous rounds. Um, well, let me let me run through the games from last weekend. Molder nil, Wallerenga nil. Uh, obviously, Molder was saving their performance for uh, Galatasaray, of course. Goal is there. Odd nil, Salzburg three. Brand ran out five one winners at home to Arlesund. Uh 
Haugerson, one glimp, three, two for Pellegrino, one for Mumbanya. Hamcam, three, Rosenborg, nil. That's a massive result. Maybe a bit of a hangover for Rosenborg post Europe. Uh, Tromsø, one, Sandefjord, nil. I think that was one of your weekend preview games. Um, and then Viking, Starbeck as well, one nil to Viking. They keep their good form going. And it was all rounded off by Strom's God set, Lillestrom, uh, 2 1 to Lillestrom, away win there. Then also an Ibrahimai cancelling out Melkerson's goal. So, um, the state of play at the moment, Steve, I mean, let's just talk about that Hamcam game. That's quite significant, mm. isn't it? Big win, really big win for Hamcam. Three goals to nil. If you'd listened to the weekend preview show, I did tip them at a big price to beat them right on the nose. And uh, it was a good time of phase, reasonable, let's be honest, after. There uh, it was a really energy exhausting game, wasn't it, in Scotland? But still, you've got to perform uh, as well. And I think Hamcam really got in their faces here. It was a bit of a bitty game. Um, yeah, it was uh, wasn't exactly the most placid of uh, surroundings. There was a bit of needle out there, I think, uh, both on and off the field. Um, an incident after the game in the uh, in the interview room where. Uh, Jakob Mickelson, the uh, ham cam manager, had his two kids with him. And, uh, you know, sometimes that happens, doesn't it, in interviews where you enjoy in the moment and your family is sometimes around. And uh, I don't think Fine Marlon was too happy about that. The Rosenborg manager told him to hurry up with your kindergarten, basically, stuff like that. No one really knows exactly what he said. Um, Mickelson didn't like it, told him to F off. Uh, so that was a spicy finish to the game. Um but uh, I mean, on the field of the SA, Hamcam did really well. They just they've got themselves about physically. I think they deserve the win and uh, a big win because I think probably Rosenborg will win more than they lose towards the end of the season. So other teams down there when they face Rosenborg may end up on the losing side. And uh, it's now um, two wins in a row for Hamcam. You know, much after that shocking run of form they had around sort of late spring. Uh, they're now up to 22 points. They've got a six-point gap to the relegation zone. So, um, yeah, it did look really, really bad, didn't it, for Hamcam at one point? I'm just trying to find this really bad run of, of uh, form that they had. Um, yeah, I, I thought they were... Yeah, they lost eight out of nine at one point. And at that stage, I worried for them. I really did. I thought I, 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 they may well be going down. Teams can sometimes really just don't get out of that sort of funk. But they now won five of the last seven games. I mean, that's impressive going, isn't it? Very impressive going. And that's a big win, actually. I think, um, like we mentioned, there's only four games this weekend. So we'll just quickly run through uh, those matches. It's uh, Rosenborg are in action. They're one of the few teams. They're at home to Arlison. Wallerengo against Odd at home. Wallerengo at home to Odd. Sandefjord, Haugerson and Sarpsborg. Tromso is the early game on the Saturday. Um, Steve, I think you just want to... Uh, quickly touch on one other talking point, which is um, the top three are winning the game. But mm. I want to frame it with a question from a very important listener of the show who uh, has been contributing quite well lately. So thank you very much. Um, and that is Big Sig. He asks at Big Sig 5, how serious of a title contender is Viking at this point? Uh, and he says, last weekend, the top five in the league and played the bottom five. Mulder dropping points. Trums are winning late. Buda going down before turning around. Which of those games was the biggest surprise to you? Um, you don't have to answer that one if you don't want, Steve. I know Trums is a bit of a sore point for you at this moment in time. But uh, how, how seriously should we be taking Viking? Which have won 10 games in a row. So I think they have to be taken very, very seriously, don't they? Um, David Bracalo, I think, got the winning goal against 10-man Starbeck. Bracalo is actually linked with uh, a move away. Luton Town are in for him, possibly Coventry City, uh, Mitchelland as well. So they, that would be a big loss. I mean, I was thinking the other day about already, you know, what would be my best 11 of the season in Elite Serian so far. And David Bracalo would definitely be in that X1. So... Important win for Viking. I mean, it's no all all the top three won. There was no shocks here. Um, we all thought there would be Sandefjord for Tromsø, Viking against Starbeck, and Glimp were away at Haugus. And what was a surprise is how how difficult Viking and Tromsø made life for themselves. They both needed late goals. Um, 
you know, if he can keep doing this, they've nicked some really late winners this year. And that, that's the sign of a champion, isn't it? Or a team that's definitely not folding under pressure. Um, Tromso as well got themselves a late goal. It was a, a game which I think both teams probably had quite a lot of chances in. There was uh, an incredible double save, actually, from the Sanderfield keeper at one one point. Um, but I think it was around the 80th minute just before Tromso scored. I couldn't believe a goal wasn't scored um, in that period. So a massive chance for Tromso to put a bit of pressure on the top two this weekend when they go to Sarpsborg away, which that could end literally anything because you just don't know which version of Sarpsborg will show up on the day at all. Uh, but if Tromso do win that, they're up to 42. And... Um, you know, that would really be a genuine three horse. It is a three horse race anyway, because Trump's have got a game in hand. But um, that would put a bit of pressure on the two teams that are not playing. But yeah, as you were at the top, Molder, not that they were really in the race, uh, but they're now 10 off the top. And with, uh, you know, 11 games left, that's asking probably a lot for them, especially as they're going to be involved in European competitions. Um, they might have to win the Norwegian Cup to get back into Europe at this rate which would be kind of ridiculous, wouldn't it? But um, I I just keep thinking that, you know, Viking Tromso or even both are just going to have to falter at some stage. You feel like it should happen. They're just waiting. For, I'm just waiting for it to happen. But it's, it's not, not, not happening yet. Not happened yet. And I think that is pretty much where we're going to leave the show. Uh, it's been an emotional one. Bit of a roller coaster. But I think a good one. So hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter at Nordic Foot Pod. As always, we're on YouTube as well. And Steve, I think one week you're going to have to read out some of these YouTube comments because we do we seem to get comments every week on YouTube. And I feel like I think you are manning that account at times. But um, we do get some insightful comments that maybe we should sort of pull up and put sort of you know reply to on the show maybe. Um, but yeah, if you haven't subscribed, then check out the YouTube if you want to listen to it in a different way, of course. And we do have bonus content on there at times with a player analysis on our Patreon, patreon.com slash Nordic Football Podcast. And of course, if you ever have any questions for us, send them in as well. You can email us. We have a few emails tonight from Watford fans. Um, so, yeah, we've we've been asked to go on a few different shows, haven't we, Steve, at the moment? But uh, I'm not sure where we sit, sit on that at this moment in time. I think the schedules are, the schedules are pretty busy at this time of the year. But hopefully we've answered all your questions, um, especially on transfers, players moving in and out. Uh, we probably do. I mean, if you do follow us on on the Patreon and subscribe, um, Steve very kindly put together a bit of a fantasy preview. So don't miss out that as well, because we do actually do provide some fantasy content at times. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um, we'll be back to look at all the European action as well soon. Uh, it's at like the time of the year, really, where it's a little bit of a different flavour, isn't it, to the pod where we've got these European games to talk about. So um, well done, Mr. Meatman. Yes, um, the YouTube channel. <clears throat> I do apologise to anyone who I don't respond to on there. I do man that channel, and it, I sometimes uh, forget about some of the comments. I doesn't. I don't get the notifications as I should. Um, but yeah, you know, maybe um, maybe one day we'll do a live YouTube podcast, and people can ask us questions live on air. I don't know if you fancy that one, Charles, and that would be uh, rather an intriguing one, wouldn't it? Um, then then we're definitely going to answer everyone's questions, but. Uh, yeah, I'd be up for it. A, a pleasure to have everyone on um, this show uh, again. Listening to these uh, episodes, you, the support that's out there is fantastic for us, and uh, we appreciate all the great comments. And it's been great being with you again, Jonathan. And until next time, maybe goodbye from me. Bye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.